Hey guys, it's Hayden here. Maybe this isn't real. Maybe this is not what's happening. I thought maybe the psychosis was caused by DMT and not the cannabis. Ladies and gentlemen, fairies and leprechauns, welcome to Leo Listens. Please welcome Hayden. Hayden, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate you know I appreciate you inviting me. I'd like to start this off with just a wee introduction. So a simple, easy question. If you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? Um, huh. Superpower in the world. Any superpower. It would probably be to, to be able to experience other people's experience. So to be able to like blend with them and understand fully their perspective, to be able to walk into their shoes. So be able to like blend with the tree or blend with the grass or blend with the earth or blend with you and really like feel what it is to be Leo or feel what it is to be someone else. So I can, you know, understand where people are at, you know, and understand why they do the things they do and where it comes from. Wow. Great answer. I was not expecting that. I uh, think that like shows your, empathetic uh touch that you have wanting to experience what other things feel like be pretty cool to be a tree for a day wouldn't it unless it was getting chopped down Mm -hmm. well that might be a good experience too so you know what it feels like to be chopped down as a tree true the adversary so you know what you're doing when you're hitting a tree (laughs) (laughs) true uh all right so hidden This podcast is called Finding Sanity because our aim is to help other people find sanity. And you and me have dived deep into the realms of psychosis. Uh, If you don't mind, would you mind sharing the story of before you first developed psychosis? So it involved a DM tea trip is that correct mm-hmm. yeah uh so i know you've got a big video on this where it sh- shares the story um but if you could uh, do like a brief summary of that story if you don't mind yeah sure so um basically before psychosis um i was somebody who struggled quite a bit um, with a lot of things. I struggled with anxiety, depression, uh, most, mostly social anxiety, but as anxiety kind of creeps into one area of your life, it kind of sort of creeps into other areas of your life as well. Um, and so I was kind of plagued by this chronic anxiety and depression and creates a lot of suffering. So as any rational person would, um, would do, you try to end the suffering or find an answer to relieve it in some way so I turned to spiritual traditions I turned to um you know possibly ways of relieving it um and so some ways of trying to relieve that were healthy and others weren't so um I used some cannabis I wasn't like a cannabis user I would say but I you know it was it gave me something to kind of escape a little bit you know something I like look forward to like my friends would be like oh we're gonna smoke this weekend I'd be like oh that, that, you know that'll be nice yeah. and you know when you're when you're in the moment you don't really like you don't realize you're using it to escape but like when you're really looking forward to something um and it's like that becomes like your focus to some degree like oh like this is something that like I'm really focusing on then um, looking back, you kind of realize that it's like, oh, I, I was not enjoying, like, there was part of me that was already disconnected from my life, you know, part of me that was like, not willing to be present in life and experience life to some degree. And I think that's part of just learning and growing in life. But basically, I, I use spirituality as, as a way to escape and not necessarily as a tool for healing. Um, because it's easy to get caught up in the intellectual and the dogma and all of the um sort of stuff you can learn and it intellectually it's stimulating but if you don't actually 
integrate that information and use it um, in the way that it's intended, it can be destructive because you start to compare yourself to what you think you should be and compare yourself to like, oh, well, I'm not loving or, you know, I wish I had this. I don't have this. You start to create more issues. Um, so um, really what I needed was a good coach, a good mentor, a good counselor to sort of guide me and give me the tools and reach me where I was in the moment instead of me trying to like basically um, heal myself with it, like trying to get myself out of the swamp when I'm in a swamp that is the more you move, the further in you go, you know? Yeah. yeah. As I continued to try to struggle and move through that quicksand, it got worse and worse. And I started to sort of get a disconnected view of reality and I over-spiritualized things and saw, started to look for synchronicities and all these different kinds of things. And smoking pot on occasion was not helping that. Um, and I thought that I was using pot as a way to amplify the, my spirituality, but really it was just amplifying some of those more delusional beliefs and um, not really a practical tool for me, particularly um, just, I'm speaking just for myself. It wasn't a helpful tool for me. Yeah. So can you tell us Ian, how old were you whenever you're going through this period of your life? Yeah. So most of the anxiety started, I mean, it, it started, everything has its roots in the beginning from, I think even from when we're in the womb and, yeah. and all that stuff it starts like way way early the roots of everything but i won't go that far back because i'm still yeah. sort of piecing that story back together and uh, i'll learn more about that as i go along but um, a lot of the the main anxiety that started um was probably in high school uh, just because it was a change of turf for me i moved to a, a high school that was a boarding school um the boarding school was great i had a lot of great experiences there but i also um kind of had a culture shock because there's some people who were were not super kind there and it was a different kind of meanness than I was used to. Um, I kind of had it a little bit at the other school I was at, but not with such intensity and not with such um, so like directness directed towards me. Yeah. And so I started to, um, I just, I just wanted people to like me, you know, just like everybody, you know, I wanted to be accepted and loved and, um, I didn't feel loved and accepted by certain people and I internalized a lot of that um, and it's you know it's not necessarily their fault and it's not necessarily my fault it's just that's how that's how life works sometimes you know we we just internalize things and it takes us a lot of process and so I was about 14 at the time I think 13 or 14 when I first went to high school um, and when I had my psychosis, it was I was 18 when that happened. Um, oh, okay. So it took a while. It was kind of an unfolding process, and it wasn't like uh, like all of a sudden I'm just I've just lost my mind. Um, but there was a trigger. Um, I was increasing my cannabis use, and um, and then I had an experience where um, I ended up at this guy's house. I had ended up smoking a, a very large quantity of pot. Um, and then with the cherry on top, he put DMT in the, um, in the cannabis without me knowing. And that I think just was enough to put me over the edge where I lost my connection with reality and, um, began my psychosis with the, basically, um, having a delusional perspective on, on reality and, and not really grounded in, um, in what was going on around me. I think there is always some truth to every experience. So I think no matter where you are in your life, no matter what perspective you have, there is a nugget of truth in, in, in what people are experiencing. Um, yeah. And I think looking back um, at, at psychosis, there's some things that I've learned and some things that I've experienced that I, I still use to this day, but a lot of it is, is learning how to let go of some of that stuff and learning how to not get caught in that space of um, sort of a disconnected world in some ways. So it's it's kind of psychosis is kind of weird because like you're connected but you're also like disconnected at the same time. It's it's an interesting yeah. space. You're connected to like a different world, aren't you? But you're disconnected from the world in which we need to live in. Yeah. 
you got to the point where your friend offered you, no, your friend mixed the DMT with the weed. He didn't offer you it. Um, smoking DMT on uh, intentional circumstances, mind boggling enough, never mind to be spiked with it. It's a whole new realm. Um, this friend of yours that mixed the DMT, was he, uh, did you feel like he was a good friend in school? No, I don't, I don't know if I'd call him a friend. I would say he was just an acquaintance. Like he's someone I yeah. like, had met in class and I had told him I was interested in psychedelics. Um, and I think he then took it upon himself to like induce a psychedelic state within me without my permission. Um, yeah. Which is not something you should ever do to somebody. Um, Cause it's something that like is a very personal and sacred journey. Um, and to not ask permission and to not grant that person the opportunity to prepare and to create kind of a ceremony and a, a structure for them is very uh is it's very disrespectful on disrespectful is a, a, a you know is a understatement but it, it's not yeah it's disrespectful to you and disrespectful to the drug it's disrespectful on all yeah, and all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from our previous conversations, I remember you telling me about whenever you were in the DMT trip, you turned around to look at this acquaintance and he, you could like see through his body or something like that. Could you? Tell us a bit more in detail about that. Yeah, so the DMT, when I once I ingested the DMT, I was like in this different different space. Like it was the same space, but it was like it was almost like I was seeing behind the curtain, or I was like seeing a deeper reality beyond the just the the visual that we can normally see with our eyes, but the actual like the mesh or the web behind the creation of the space in some ways it's like this the the air had like a density a texture a rainbow like color to it and yeah. i wasn't really aware of my body i wasn't even aware that i was tripping i was just like experiencing and i just was having i was having I was perceiving and that's pretty much all that was happening i was perceiving in a state of awe of just watching and that's that's the best way I can describe it there was no there was very few thoughts very very few and I turned and I just saw um this the guy who'd given me DMT I saw his soul and I saw that um it was an old soul but he looked sick and I don't really know what that means I haven't really like looked at people's souls per se like since then I've you know I haven't taken DMT obviously since then um and um I remember playing with him. This is like what I what I extrapolated from seeing him that I remember playing with him in a different dimension at some point in time, like as as children, as younger energy, as a younger um, you know energy embodiment. And um, so that was that was my first experience with like a, like something from a past life, possibly you know. And even after that, I wasn't really sure about it. Since then, I've had other experiences of past life kind of stuff um but it could just be because that's something that like i'm possibly subconsciously looking for to validate my worldview but um yeah. you know i personally believe that our 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 consciousness extends beyond just this uh this experience you know like I think there's a lot I, that could be a whole podcast on its own, but <laughs> yeah, I do want to dive into that a little bit with uh, past life regression and uh, in particular the focus on shamanism. Uh, but we're gonna gonna go back to that because I know you're heavily interested and I'm interested in it too. So you know, could be a good chat. Uh, before we get into that though, I want to go back in time a bit to. Your time in school, 
so he went to high school at 14. Uh, in Ireland, we go to high school at 11. Okay. Um, but you said that going to boarding school, you struggled to fit in with other people. Can you tell me about your experience with bullying? Hmm. Um, so there were some people, like, I had kind of my crowd that I, like, hung out with, and, like, I had some friends there. Um, and I still have a friend that I stay in touch with and like we, you know, we've met after um, I left high school and stuff and, um, you know, it's possible that I might go visit him at some point and um, he lives in San Francisco now. Oh. Um, but um, the bullying, it was, it was a lot of it was like, I don't think they meant harm per se I think I was just sensitive and that's kind of the culture they were brought in to like that's how they were kind of that's how they like relate with other people is kind of making fun of people and um you know that's their way of relating but a lot of it was um just kind of telling me like kind of tricking me in some ways like saying like oh Hayden you know you like doing this or whatever and I'd be like yeah and they're like oh that's so weird you know like kind of stuff like that where they would like pretend yeah. like it's normal and then like flip it over and then you just kind of sit there you're just kind of standing there like looking like an idiot it's like oh like I really walked into that one you know because um, yeah. you just want them to like you so you're just kind of doing everything you can to like want them to like you because that's what you're it's what everybody wants um yeah, it's like being a yes man. What's that? It's like being a yes man. Yeah, I mean that's something I I always was seeking approval from others, and that's still something that I'm working on, you know. Um, so yeah. that's kind of what I struggled with, and I was really good at hockey. Like growing up, like I was like kind of played hockey. I wasn't like amazing, but I was a great skater, and um, you know I tried out for the varsity team, and I was you know, they were like, wow, you're really good. And like, and stuff like that. But then they started making fun of me on the ice and I just lost all my confidence. Like I wasn't able to, I was just overthinking everything. I didn't know what to do. I just like froze. Cause I was like so much in my thoughts. I just didn't know like what, to, I like was just scared. I didn't know what to do. So I ended up on like JV and I really was like just a bad player at that point. Cause I, I always just played hockey intuitively. I never really thought about it. I was just, I just knew where to go. And then I just, didn't know where to go anymore. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know like how to play. It was like someone just took my gift away, um, which was uh, fine because I didn't really like, part of it was sad for me and it was hard for me to like quit hockey because that was something that like I really enjoyed um, and that's something I'd always played. But uh, I had a hard time connecting with the people and the energy of the sport. Like it was, it was very aggressive and, you know, it was about like beating up the other team and um, yeah. that's just, I just, I wasn't ready for that kind of energy. I wasn't ready to handle that. And um, I didn't, I just ended up quitting. Cause I was like, I, I, I'm not good anymore. And I don't, I don't really have any friends on the team you know nobody really like gets me no one wants to hang out with me it's just it's all superficial so I just quit I still love to skate but I don't really play hockey anymore um which makes me sad sometimes you know I wish I could still play and but I went and played um re like not too long ago like a year or two ago and I just I just don't like the the kind of people it attracts it's just it's just kind of it, it seems kind of an aggressive sport, you know, so I'd rather yeah. just do something else that's, I feel like is a more positive, uh, positive vibe, so. Yeah, something that would benefit you more. I, my knowledge of ice hockey is, ice hockey, right? When you say hockey, yeah. Ice hockey, ice hockey, yeah. Yeah, so my knowledge of it is like from the Adam Sandler movies, you know, uh, Happy Gilmore, <laughs> mm -hmm. where like, he literally just goes onto the ice rink and just beats people. He doesn't even skid. He just falls in his face and beats people. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can imagine it is a very aggressive sport filled with like uh, toxic masculinity, trying to yes. bigger other people and 
yeah. just yeah. You know what? Effectively, is like a time for people to bully one another and push them about. Like it's like fighting without the respectfulness that you have in martial arts. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Thank you for opening up about those instances. I know it's hard to talk about that. I've also suffered similarly. Uh, similarly in sports too. I used to play Gaelic football. Just like, have you heard of it before? It's uh, the national sport of Ireland. And a football that you hold in your hands and you kick it and you hold it in your hands. And it's like a mixture between soccer and rugby. Okay. Gotcha. And I was really good. But the people in the club they weren't my tribe and a lot of them are very like uh, like upper middle class and they would look down on anyone that wasn't one of them you know didn't go to their school or didn't have their sense of humor uh, but so yeah, I know how it feels man so you used weed to sort of escape at the time and you said before like whenever you're smoking it you don't realize you are escaping because you just enjoy smoking with your friends and i 100 percent agree with you as the same with me um so after your psychosis with the dmt a couple of years after that you had a cannabis induced psychosis is that right so can you share the story about reintroducing yourself to weed? Um, you know, similarly, I had a cannabis, cannabis-induced psychosis. I get a lot of people message me saying that they're struggling to get off cannabis and their psychosis is getting worse. And yeah, can you share your experience of how you got back into cannabis use and then tell us about your psychosis with it, please. Yeah, sure. So I got back into cannabis. It was like six years after my first psychosis. Um, I was doing pretty well, um, but I had taken a new job where I was working full time, 40 hours a week. Um, and it was causing a lot of stress for me and I wasn't really sure how to deal with it. Um, and, um, you know, I was like, well, maybe, you know, I, I was kind of in denial that the psychosis, I thought maybe the psychosis was caused by DMT and not the cannabis because DMT is like super powerful, obviously. And so I was like, you know what, maybe it was a fluke. Like maybe I'm in a better place now, like I'm more grounded and it'll be fine. So I ended up like, I knew a guy, um, who was kind of in my close to my circle I could reach out to him easily to get some cannabis and I did um, and I, I smoked it well actually before I did that I smoked a couple of times with some friends um, who had some and like everything went okay like I had a few I, for, the first time I smoked again it was really intense experience like I'm pretty sensitive to cannabis so like my experiences are pretty like intense especially if I haven't smoked in a while I'll like I'll have like hallucinations not like oh I like see things in the room but like I need to lie down and I'll have like a visual experience um where I'm like wow. kind of in a different place um so it can be kind of intense um so you know I had that but like other than that the first couple times I smoked like I was okay so I was like you know what maybe I'm fine maybe I can just use cannabis as like a tool to help me cope with stress so when I came back home from the trip I got some cannabis and I was using it um for about three months and I was getting in a better mood you know I felt better I felt happier I felt like um it was helping me learn about myself I was you know sort of self-discovery and stuff like that um but I was kind of slipping into a manic state a little bit um and I was sort of hanging out with this girl um who's like a you know, was a very spiritual person, like very focused on the spiritual aspect of things. And we went to this play that was like very much like psychosis. Like it was like 
the play was about psychosis, basically. Serious? Yeah, it was crazy. It, it, that's what it seemed like. And then we left the play, and I gave her a hug, and it was a very intense experience. Um, it's hard to explain to people how intense this hug was, but it was like there's just like a connection, like my heart, like kind of opened up, and it like I don't know, it was it was weird, but it put me in a state of shock because I wasn't ready for that kind of intensive an experience. And from that state of shock, I kind of like slipped into psychosis slowly. Um, but I had quit cannabis like two weeks before that. I was I quit cold turkey because I just felt like I was just doing it because it was something to do and not because it was actually helping me anymore. It felt like just escape and just like it wasn't really helping. So I just I decided to quit um, cold turkey and just felt like something I should do. So I did, and then two weeks later, after that hug, is when the psychosis um, actually started. So slowly, I like slowly slipped into it. The recovery from that one was a lot quicker than the first one. Uh, it wasn't necessarily easy per se, but it was um, smooth. The depression afterwards was um, was actually more difficult in some ways because it was more psychological versus emotional. Um, so I like. I struggled with suicidal thoughts. Whereas in the first one, I was just so emotionally tired, emotionally drained that I didn't even have time and space to think about suicide because I was just like so drained. Um, whereas the second one, I had like more energy, uh, but I was just spending a lot of time in my head thinking about stuff and, you know, creating this um, narrative of, of wanting to not live anymore in my head, you know? And so. Um, that was hard to kind of get through, but I was able to work through it. So I'm very happy you did work through it, man, because you're uh, you're influencing me and influencing a lot of other people. So you did a good job, man. Thanks. I would like to bring it back to your psychotic episodes okay um so your psychosis with after the dmt where you went to school after it mm. is that right yeah um that story you told me was fascinating would you mind sharing it yeah sure so after the dmt i kind of came down i blacked out and then i came back um, I drove back to my parents' house um, and I gave them gifts and said I was leaving and um, that I was going to go to Mexico with this guy that had just given me DMT and stuff. Um, and um, so they froze all my bank accounts and stuff. And then I went to this Native American mountain, spent the night there, bought a bunch of groceries, went to school. And at school, I was like telling people things like speaking in metaphors. Um, you know, I thought I was this enlightened being that could like understand people and some of the insights I had about people were true, but I wasn't able to like articulate those in a way that like made sense to them. Like I told this one, this one um, classmate in the class that she needed to get naked, you know, because not that like she had to physically disrobe, but that she was wearing clothes to hide her true self. She wasn't like allowing herself to be um who she truly is and so i was like take the off. you know take take off the mask take the mask off yeah yeah and so she's, yeah. she's hiding from herself she's not being honest with herself so you know speaking of metaphors and stuff like that and um just like yeah. going in and out of the classroom creating issues the teacher thought i was on drugs i'm pretty sure because I, th I think she's like what did you take and i was like i didn't take anything I'm just, you know, I'm just being me. Um, but there was such like a rush, a high of, of like emotion and like feeling like connected to something much bigger. And um, it was uh, just riding this high thinking I was like this God or enlightened being. And I drove off. My girlfriend was scared of me at the time. She called my mom and told me there's something wrong. And, uh, you know, I ended up driving off into the the distance i went to go see my mentor actually and he was like he celebrated it which i think he thought i was high i don't know why he didn't say like we need to get you somewhere safe like obviously you're like in a 
in an altered state right now. You need to be in a safe place. He was like, oh, like you've made it. He was not a good mentor for me at the time. He was not, um, you know, he was, he had obviously some, some issues he wasn't um, able to deal with and was not helpful to me. Well, we, can we pause there? Um, the, the way you say he celebrated it, do you mean he played along with your delusions at the time? Yeah, he kind of like went along with the psychosis. He did. Wow. Yeah. What a dick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he was okay. not not a great person. Like, yeah, not not great. Because I think he thought I was um, on high on mushrooms or something, you know. So. But if you're uh, high on mushrooms, if someone was high on mushrooms and they drove to my house or drove to like where I work, I would be like, I would be respectful to them. I'd be like, you're on a journey right now. Like, I understand you're on, you're on a quest, you're on a mission right now. But um, in order for you to accomplish your mission or to do the mission safely, we need to make sure you're in a safe space, you know, so don't get in your car again. We're going to make sure we're going to bring you to where you can be, you can experience this, but do it in a safe way. You know, that's kind of how I would handle that situation. Yeah, with a lot more compassion. Yeah, because like when someone's not in their right mind, you don't want them in a vehicle, you know, <laughs> you you don't want yeah. them unsupervised. Um, and he did both of those things. He, he basically encouraged it, let me go back in my car. And he, he didn't tell my mom about it. He didn't reach out to my parents. And you're on your journey. And it's like, <laughs> wow. You know, that's wow. pretty, pretty irresponsible. <laughs> Extremely, yeah. I, I ended up crashing my car. So he literally could have prevented me from crashing my car by just saying, Hayden, like, I, I respect where you are right now. Just stay here. We're going to we're going to get you some help. You know, we're going to help you. That's all I had to do. Call my mom. My mom would have come. She would probably would have brought me somewhere, probably a psych ward or something, but at least I wouldn't have crashed my car. You know, I wouldn't have done things like that. Like I'm not dishonoring my journey that I did have because like I learned some things from that, but like that was a lesson in itself that like, that's something you don't do to someone, you know, you, yeah. you make sure that they're safe in their if they're if they're not all right yeah at least you've learned how to deal with it if someone else ever happens to be in that situation with you you'd be more it's a lesson of respect isn't it um yeah that's a terrible mentorship i hope he gets removed of his uh of whatever his mentor certificate is. He, he doesn't um, have a mentor certificate. He was just a guy. He was just a chiropractor who, like, I don't know. I, I like, I was desperate to have someone to teach me stuff. So I, I kind of, like, latched on to somebody who would teach me something. But he wasn't teaching me the right, the things that would actually help me. He, he taught me things that made things worse. Right. That's unfortunate. It's, so you, I chose that. I, I brought that into my life. You know, I'm also responsible for that. You know, I, I made those choices too. So um, he's yeah. just as responsible in some ways as I was. I was think I was in a vulnerable state. So he might've had a little bit more responsibility because he's an adult, but I yeah. also played, I played into that dynamic as well. So yeah. yeah. So you crossed your car after that and then what happened uh then i i walked in i walked um took put my backpack on went walking um decided to take my pants off i saw my boxers on but i was walking just in my boxers uh ended up at this lady's house and then the lady called the cops the cops came and they brought me to the hospital and you had incidents with a hawk in the middle of this? Is that right? 
Oh yeah, hawks. I saw hawks everywhere. I well, I mean, I was looking for them because that's like something that was like a validation or like a spiritual sign that I was like on the right path, you know, quote unquote. Um, so it was like validation. I'm like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I am enlightened. I am this. I am that. You know, and um, so I that was like my um, my sign, I guess. You know, and so um, I uh, I followed that. So it was, it was, uh, he was, he was with me through the whole kind of experience. I, I still think there was, there was a, it felt like something was holding space for me in some ways. Um, it didn't feel like I was alone in the experience, but I, I also think we're never alone. You know, I don't think we're alone right now speaking. Um, there's the kind of this illusion that we're separate from, uh, from other people, from the world. Um, but that that separation is is just um, it's it's the way we perceive ourselves. It's the way we perceive the world. Because if you think about it, um, and you actually connect with the space, you realize that the air we're breathing in right now is literally coming from either the ocean or the plants. Um, you know that have created that oxygen. You know. Yeah. So on a physical level, we're connected, but also on an emotional and spiritual level, from my experience, we are too. Um, and it's, you can never really be disconnected per se, um, but we choose to not acknowledge the connection. We choose to be disconnected because we're not taught how to open that up and how to be connected in that way. Um, and that's, you know, where shamanism comes in. Yeah. So I think that's, that's where some truth comes in with, with these psychosis experiences, because you feel that connection and that openness and the grandeur of like wow, this existence is beautiful and like magical and, and like mystical, you know? Um, and there's some truth to that, um, I think. But it's um, when you get stuck on one side or the other side is when there's a problem. You know, when you get stuck in a psychotic state where you're disconnected from reality versus when you're stuck in a in a state where you feel like you're not connected to anything and you have like no connection to other people or to the world or to the plants and animals in the world that we're dependent on to survive um of course we feel disempowered and depressed you know that's uh we need connection we're designed to connect that's how the world goes around that's how the universe goes around everything is connected it's all about connection everything is is connection and when you don't have that peace, then uh, life feels pretty small. Yeah, well, um, we're all sociable animals as well. And we're all a part of the earth. And we are all life forms and energy within this earth. And whenever you're in that psychotic state, you're so much more sensitive to energy, aren't you? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote by Joseph Campbell. It's... Uh, the psychotic drowns in the same water that the shaman swims in. Mm. And uh, that uh, relates very heavily to what you just described there. Yeah. Um, so, Hayden, after that, you went to hospital. Um, and you had a pretty traumatic time in the hospital, right? Uh, to some degree, um, like the the experience I had in the hospital, the first like um, when Here's I was something I found on the web. The Alexa, off. <laughs> was, was that Alexa? That was Alexa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Alexa, off. <laughs> Fuck off, Alexa. <laughs> no, I love Alexa, but. Oh, I gotta stop! I gotta stop saying her word, her name. I love her, but sometimes she she chimes in when uh, she hasn't been invited to. But um, that's okay. Um, so yeah, the the hospital experience, the first like few days when I was admitted to the psych ward, I don't remember much of it because um, they had me on a lot of medication. Um, but the the experience wasn't bad, really. Um, it was just like 
from my experience, the psychosis part isn't that hard. It's not that it's like there's some scary parts. There's some like some scary parts, some intense parts, a lot of like drama and intense like sort of beliefs about the world and like this means that and this means this and I need to like get this accomplished or achieve this. But it all makes sense and it all like it it has its place in your worldview and so it doesn't feel like confusing or 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 hard or it's just like oh I need to do this this is part of my journey my quest my mission you know um for me the struggle was more like when I got out of the hospital and I realized that a lot of the things that I was believing and and following and pursuing were in vain because it was always like another quest it was like I got to the end of the quest and I'm like oh when I get this quest like you know I'll have like this enlightenment I'll have this understanding and then I get there and nothing would happen and I do the same thing and then nothing would happen and I just started realizing like maybe this isn't real maybe this is not what's happening and when I started to realize that that's when it got hard that's when it got like shit what is actually happening what is what is reality who am I do I have a purpose am I worth it like not worth anything but like just this that's when the depression starts to come and that's when the doubts that's when like the the feeling of just feeling lost and not knowing you're almost like a baby like you're moving in you're moving out of one world into a new world you're like being born again you have to learn how to think how to process how to have a perspective on the world how how do I view the world how you know how do I do this how do I do it in a way that actually is aligned with reality because if I'm like trying to have this mission and try to solve this problem but I get to the end and it's not solving it where where do I start what do I do what do I change so it's like this whole deprogramming and it's that's that's the hard part and then the depression afterwards because of that that's hard and then the reintegration process that's hard and so for me, that was, that was the challenge and that was the difficulty. The psychosis itself presented its, its problems and its challenges, but um, the work to come back is the hardest part from my experience. Yeah, it's definitely the most challenging part. Yeah, it is like a rebirth, isn't it? Like literally have to relearn everything in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in your recovery stage where you did have to relearn, um, were there many things that you changed about your mm, life or personality within your recovery? Um, maybe not so much my, I mean, my personality, our personality is like, always changing you know every day I'm like a different person based off the experiences I've had but I think the biggest thing that I changed was like how I approached my thoughts and how I approach my how I view the world I, I kind of adopted a more like scientific um, way of viewing the world so it was less like interpretation and intuitive it was a very like grounded like is this real like if I do this, will this happen? You know, and if the answer is no, then it's like, maybe I don't need that view anymore. Maybe I don't need to think that way anymore. So it's like very like practical, like mathematical way of thinking, you know? So yeah. I kind of had to let go of my spiritual thinking as much as I could, like stop reading spiritual books, stop reading things that were like fantasy, fantasy or things that weren't like grounded in reality, you know? Um, so I started like watching like kid shows like like Spongebob or you know just shows that were like simple and there was no like I mean I would always like look for the messages in the in the shows but it was like it, it just helped me to like ground I guess in some way and to like feel like I understood things better and music too music helped me to sort of like process and understand and feel emotions you know feel things and um feel like i'm home i would listen to like very um 
music that would make me feel better inside, you know, like warm and fuzzy and love based music. Um, nice. So, um, it was, I was changing in the, in the sense that I was letting go some of the more spiritual and more like ungrounded or non provable worldviews out, you know, in, in my, in my psychology. Since then, I've kind of like brought a lot of those back in because I have the foundation and the platform to be able to build on top of that. Um, um, and it's not like they were ever gone. It was just the, like I kind of set them aside for a little bit. You know, it's like when you get injured or something from sports, you break your leg, you put, like, you put your soccer equipment in the closet for a little bit. You know, you let your, your legs heal. You're not going to go on the field and start kicking the ball, you know you have to do your routine you have to do your weights to like get your legs strong again so it's kind of the same thing it's like let's put these to the side for now because we're not ready for this at this point you know yeah it's great that you said you listened to music that made you feel you know like your heart was fuzzy and like felt make you feel good it's quite easy to do the opposite of that and listen to sad music whatever you're sad however like you know you suck in your environment and so by listening to sad music it's going to make you more sad and by listening to happy music it's going to make you more happy and uh you play trumpet and guitar is that right yeah so i I played the trumpet in high school but i I never like really continued it because I, I enjoy playing an instrument that I can like sing with and like the only, you can only play like one note at a time with the trumpet where I, I like having like harmonies and like be able to like create like a, an ambiance, which is yeah. like hard to create with just a trumpet with like a guitar and a voice you can create and um, you can, you can do a lot with a voice and a guitar, you know? So uh, that's kind of like why I like the guitar. Um, but yeah, I do play the guitar. I played the gu- I actually learned to play the guitar during my psychosis recovery. Actually, that was one of my tools I used to help myself sort of ground and have something to do um, and express myself. You know, were there any songs in particular that you learned during your psychosis recovery on the guitar? All All Washed Out by Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. That's that was oh. my go to song for when I wasn't feeling well to help me get through what I was going through. Nice. Do you happen to have your guitar handy? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I can go get I think it's in the living room, but I can yeah. grab it. Would you like to play the song that Sure. I yeah. can play it. Yeah, I'll be right back. Yeah, awesome. So uh to accompany you, I brought my bongos. Oh nice. That's cool. <laughs> nice. So uh I'll try and play along to the beat. Just make sure it's in tune. I'll make sure the drums in tune. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good, yeah. So this is All Washed Out by Edward Sharp and the Magnet Zeros. Nice. Just 
That was fucking amazing, dude. Thanks, man. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, you must have practiced that song a lot because you are phenomenal, man. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I played it a lot. Um, that was like, like I said, my go-to song. Like, if I wasn't feeling well, I would just play that song. Wow, that fuzzy feeling you were mentioning in your heart, I can feel that now. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's. That's what I feel when I play it, so that I'm glad you could feel that too. Well, energy definitely radiates me. Oh, it's, that was amazing. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, for playing that. That was uh, that was beautiful. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to play. That was that was a good a good experience. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, that was amazing. I uh, you've got a serious talent, mate. Thank you. Thanks. Do you? Uh, do you uh do you publicly play your music anywhere? No, I don't. No. No. Have you considered it? No, I mean I've I've thought of it, but I kind of just I kind of just play when I feel like it. Like maybe in the future, like if I do seminars and things like that, where I'm like with a bunch of people and I feel like sharing like a message of hope, or I feel like sharing just a vibe or like a, an energy, you know, I might just pick up my guitar and play that song just so they can, you know, feel what they need to feel and say what they need to say with their heart, you know, so just let, let go. It needs to be let go. The song's about letting go and accepting love and realizing that um, we're holding on to things um, and, and blaming others and blaming ourselves and that sometimes it's just time to let it go and just, let it rain, you know, let it wash out in the rain. Wow, beautiful message behind us as well. Amazing, man. Um, do you have much of a busking culture where you live? Uh, what, uh, what kind of culture you said? Busking, so playing on the street, music? Uh, no, because it's not like, it's not really like a an inner city or like it's not like a very high density population like i live in a city but it's like really spread out so there's not like a bunch of high traffic areas there's not a lot of people that play in the street it's not like a boston or new york or something like that right but even if like i wanted to do that i don't have like a big enough set list to be able to like do that there's i know like a few songs but i don't I, i don't have enough songs memorized um to to really play in a setting like that i would need to like master the guitar more and uh practice singing a little bit more because my voice would get tired quickly because i don't i don't really sing i haven't sang in like i don't know maybe a month maybe three weeks i don't know it's been a long time so um it's it's something you'd have to practice but maybe in the future you know life's a mystery so maybe in the future i'll be a, a a musician or something yeah, but you know, keep it up, and uh, you definitely have the potential for it. Like your singing is very in tone, and uh, you have a very good combination with the guitar and the vocals. Yeah, I loved it, man. Thanks. Uh, so other things that you picked up while in your recovery is juggling too, right? Yeah, I did pick up juggling. Are there any other activities that you picked up during your recovery? Not that I know of. Um, I guess hikes to some degree, like hiking is something that I kind of picked up more. I had done hiking before, but I it became more of something that I do for self-care in my recovery process. So it's something that I realized I enjoyed more. Um, it kind of gave me something to do and get me out of my head a little bit, just move my body. So... Um, I would still think a lot on my walks, but at least it would like give me space to be able to like 
kind of walk through my thoughts instead of like just saying still with my thoughts like like not still like meditation still but still like stagnant still you know yeah um so having that movement and walking allowed some of those hard structures and thought concepts to kind of like break down a little bit and allow me to like move forward in my day or move forward in my process so I still had the thoughts and still had the delusions, but it was a tool, I guess. Beautiful, man. Ironically enough, uh, same as me. Uh, <laughs> juggling, hiking, and music, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, That's cool. So, Hayden, I want to delve into spirituality and shamanism now. Okay. So... In particular with your hawk, it was very, uh, it had much of a spiritual significance. And your friend Iggy is teaching you shamanism. Mm. So how did you get reintroduced with spirituality? As you said, you were like avoiding all of that for a while during your recovery and then you got back into it. So. How did you get back into it? It was always there. So it's kind of like, you know, when your leg heals and you're kind of like uh, going back to the soccer analogy, if you like break your leg and, um, you know, your leg's starting to feel better. And then like the thirst for playing soccer kind of comes back and you're like, you know, you know, like maybe I can play soccer again now, you know, maybe my leg's ready to go. And so you kind of like go out and you like are careful at first. You're a little bit tentative. You try out your leg. You don't push yourself too hard. And you're kind of kicking the ball around and um you like slowly gradually like get more into it but like you're more cautious now because you broke your leg playing soccer you know so like the way you approach the game is different because you don't want to get hurt again so you don't maybe go for the slide tackle that like maybe you could get but you might get hurt doing it or you might not you might just let the guy go past you even though like you probably could walk him but you still enjoy playing the game you know you're not as invested in like I need to get this or I need to do this. So it changed the relationship I had with, with spirituality and the fact that like I need to be careful with how much I invest into it, how far I go into like with my mind, like how, how I get stuck in a, a thought loop or stuck in like this is, you know, the abstract concepts and stuff because it's easy to get stuck in a kind of a uh, echo chamber with, uh, with spirituality and you get lost because it's not really like something that's tangible in a lot of ways yeah sometimes so i sort of reintroduced myself slowly um and i did yoga um i did um reiki um so i studied some reiki to just kind of like learn how to work with the energy and stuff um i studied um which I had the experience of like the, the spirituality I'd studied before my psychosis, like Buddhism and stuff like that. Um, but I was just like building on to it, building on to it. And I found Iggy at a drum circle at the Reiki Center. Um, and that's, I met him and I saw him facilitate a drum circle. And I really like, I could see that he knew what he was doing. And he was very like, um, I could just tell like this guy knows what he's doing, you know. Uh, so I, I talked to him and I was like, you know, I'd really love to learn from you. I'd love to like, I can see the work you're doing and like, I would love to know like how it works and how I can do the work that you do, you know? So that, that started that relationship and that pro even that process, the journey that I went through with Iggy for learning shamanism, it's taken, it's been like two years, you know, and it's, it's been like a slow and progressive journey. It hasn't been like uh, fireworks or like, oh, all of a sudden, like, I understand everything. You know, it's like he gave me exercises to do. He gave me thoughts to think about. He gave me little um, sort of tasks to do, you know, to like think about, reflect and meditations and stuff and just hanging out with him and seeing how he interacts with people. That's kind of how I learned what I've learned today was interacting in that way with him um, and the environment. 
Um, so my, my spiritual life has kind of like gradually grown through those experiences, through the Reiki. And I kind of take pieces and parts that I like from each of them. I did martial arts too a little bit. Take pieces and parts that make sense. And when I feel like it doesn't resonate anymore, I feel like I'm moving on to the next kind of phase or, you know, whatever, I move on. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of how it's developed, I guess, you know? So it's kind of slowly reintroduction with, uh, with that kind of stuff. Awesome. What kind of exercises did you do with Iggy? So a lot of it was the first exercise that I did with Iggy was uh, meditation with trees. So sitting with a tree um, for seven days, not seven days straight, like seven days, like, you know, seven 24 hour days, but you sit with a tree seven days in a row for like, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, you know, at a time. And just sit and just listen, just be there and just listen to the space, listen to just what's there. And, um, just be there with the tree and journal what that experience was like and uh, that was the first exercise and then did the same with the sun um, I think we did the moon maybe the stars too um, um, I'm still working on doing the mushrooms um, not magic mushrooms but sitting with mushrooms um, I recently kind of got like over analyzing and stuck in my head too much so I had to kind of take a break um, cause I was getting a little bit stuck in, um, too much overthinking. So I had to slow down and sort of reground myself. So I haven't finished the, the, the meditation with the mushrooms, which the mushroom meditation is very powerful meditation. Cause it really brings you within yourself. Um, so it's, uh, kind of brings up the stuff that you've kind of pushed away for a while. So I think that also might be why that stuff's coming up and I'm not really ready to go back into that space yet, but I know I will at some point and I'll go back to meditating with mushrooms, but um, it's just a gradual kind of journey and process, you know, constantly working on it. Yeah. Take it one step at a time. Can you describe the meditation with the trees and the moon and the mushrooms is there a sort of typical structure to the meditation or is it simply following the breath with this surrounding? So it's, it's more of a focus on just listening and, and being in the space and like connecting with that specific um, object. So connecting with the, the tree, you know, connecting with that and feeling the, the energy from that and feeling the, the roots, feeling the, the leaves you know feeling the connection to the to the sun to the air to the other trees underneath the soil and understanding that there's there's this whole other world this whole other narrative um, that is there you know and that a tree is is its own entity and has its own um, reality and perspective you know it doesn't see the world in the same way we do it has a completely different experience but it has consciousness and a life force behind it and you can sense that when you're present with the, with the tree and you listen you know and you know some people will probably disagree with me and some people will say like no it's not alive but you know it doesn't have this life force or whatever which is fine you know that's you have the right to uh to believe that and on some level that's true too because it's it's not alive in the same way that we are we're alive in a different way uh, but it, the tree is still alive and there's something that's gone when it's dead you know there's something that's that's gone when it's not there anymore there's something different when it's a sapling and a big tree and then it's a rotting log there's a there's a change that's happened there so what's the change you know you could look at it at a biological level well it doesn't have a circulation it doesn't have um the the leaves aren't growing anymore you know the um the the function's just not working anymore it's like well isn't that a form of intelligence? Isn't that a form of, of technology of, of, a, of, you know, of life, you know, um, you can look at it from the scientific perspective, but there's many different ways of, of looking at it, but it's, there's something that's alive there, you know, and uh, I think that anything that's alive, even a rock, 
you know, is alive to some degree, is having its own experience, you can connect with the rock, you can connect with the guitar, you can connect with, with anything. It's not gonna like talk to you like you and I are talking, but there's there's a there's an energy blueprint there that is that is that is real and that if you listen to, um, you can be open to, you know. Uh, and it's not fireworks, it's not like, oh my god, this guitar is like talking to me and like it can be like that you know but it yeah it's as simple as just saying it's it's simple as like just connecting and acknowledging the guitar with more than just it's just this thing that is here you know it's really appreciating that this guitar literally came from all around the world you know like this guitar has is it in the frame it's in this frame this guitar is made of metal it's made of wood uh, it's made of plastic. So where did the wood come from? You know, who knows where it came? It came from maybe the U.S., maybe a different country. The metal, maybe a completely different place on the planet. You know, all of these things came together to make this guitar that I now use, that is in my hand. You know, there's a whole lot of processes and things that happened before for this guitar to come here to me today. So just the fact that it has all those experiences, it has a story to tell. It has some memory imprints on it that it went through. You know, just the fact of it being crafted in this way, the thread had to be threaded into this specific shape. You know, that's a story, that's a narrative that it went through an experience, a blueprint that is imprinted onto that physically, but also I think energetically as well. So those kind of those are the kind of things that when when you're a shaman, when you're someone who listens and really pays attention to how the world works and how things connect you start to appreciate and realize that there is such a bigger picture and so many different perspectives and so many different angles at which to view things and that there's so much more going on in this world than like you could possibly imagine the more you listen and the more you pay attention and the more you open your heart to those things the more you start to understand yourself others and the more you're able to bridge gaps, the more you're able to bridge conflict and peace and bring peace into the world because you realize that there really is no separation and you're able to find that common ground and find the connection between everything, between all things, you know, because we're all part of the same thing. It's just that we're all seeing it from different, different vantage points, different parents, different cultural backgrounds, different um experience different dna different lineage you know everything um but finding the commonality is possible and um it's there uh, but it, it's just a matter of acknowledging that and being grateful and and opening your heart to that that's that's the that's the the opening the the journey the 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 portal into the shamanic realm basically you know yeah wow amazing man that was beautiful uh you really did put perspective you know everything around us does come from all over the world like i've got a pot of mint tea here the mint probably comes from uh, morocco or something this mug comes from like austria or something this laptop's probably taiwan the lights are chinese the table fuck knows where that comes from and it all comes from a living source. Mm. Uh, like, you know, the tree is a life form, as you said. It has a birth, it has a death, it has a in the middle. And there is an energy that comes off him. I uh, in intuitively went for a walk the other day and, like, just put my hand on the tree. And, like, you can just, you can feel the energy of it if you allow yourself to feel it. I mean, yeah, it doesn't spark fireworks, like you said. It doesn't talk to you and tell you, like, Hayden, I am your father. <laughs> right. Shares energy. Yeah, there's no words. There's just energy. Um, so, Hayden, I want to take it back to your recovery and your use of antipsychotic medication. Mm. So... Can you describe the medication that you were taking and you are taking and the effects that 
it has had on you. Yeah, sure. So I've taken a few different medications, but the only one that I've like stayed on for a long period of time is Risperdone. And that's the one that I'm still on today. Um, I took Latuda, um, but that was not a pleasant experience. Um, Risperdone, it hasn't really like, um, I'm on such a low dose that it doesn't affect me too much, but it, it kind of like levels out my my ups and downs a little bit. So I'm not as, um, I don't have as much modulation in my moods and how I'm feeling about things. Um, so um, it's helpful in that way. I was resistant to it at first though, because it's medication and nobody really wants to be on medication. And I think a lot of um, reason why people are resistant towards medication is because accepting the fact that something is not right with them, that there's something wrong with them. Um, and so accepting that is hard and you want to be a normal quote unquote person. You want to be someone who um, is free from, um, from needing some kind of pharmaceutical drug to, to help you function in life. And so I struggled with that myself too. Um, and I still struggle with it sometimes too. I'm like, man, you know, I wish I didn't have to be on medication. Um, and I don't necessarily think that I might not be on medication at some point, but at this point in my life, I feel like it's helping me and it's allowing me to be where I am right now. Um, and maybe in the future, if I find a tool that can replace that, and I feel like it's something that would make sense to do, then I might. But my goal isn't to get off of medication at this point because of, I don't really see the need to, you know, at this point. Um, it's not hampering me and it's not hindering me in any way. It's not like preventing me from living the life I want to live. Usually when I start to want to get off of it, it's usually a sign that um, something else is wrong. It's not the fact that like my life is there's something wrong with it's usually something I have like a perception of myself or like uh, I should be somewhere else or you know I'm I over spiritualize something so I'm like oh you know I'm like I need to be like this person and I have this image of who I should be and that image of who I should be isn't on medication um, so I struggle with that sometimes but uh, usually I, I can realize what's going on relatively quickly but it, it's a helpful tool for me. Um, and it, it just, like I said, sort of modulates some of those ups and downs that I have sometimes, uh, that I still have sometimes. I have highs and lows, and I'm just like everybody, uh, but someone who has had experiences with psychosis or um, bipolar disorder, the highs and lows tend to be a little bit more extreme and we tend to get uh, pulled into them more deeply and stuck in them more deeply. So the medication helps me like not go so deep into those. Yeah, as long as it helps you, man, that is the main thing. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, uh, just because you mentioned it, uh, can you explain to the listeners the diagnoses that you have? Yeah, I was diagnosed bipolar one, I think, with, um, with a tendency towards psychosis. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's my diagnosis. Yeah, cool. Probably should have asked you at the start, but it is what it is, you know. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Uh, it comes I, out when it needs to. <laughs> yeah, true that, man. Uh, so we talked about pharmaceutical healing. I'd like you to speak about holistic healing and your experience with it. Uh, what you have experimented with. Okay. Yeah. So holistic for me, holistic healing is like using all different approaches to help with healing. So um, approaching health from many different angles. So um, I think it's impossible to recover from something non-holistically because just the way life is, you know, if you're, um, it's, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're holistically healing because like um, 
So your diet is holistic. You know, your exercise is holistic. Um, supplements, holistic. Meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, just incorporating tools, other kinds of tools to help you deal with something is is holistic practice. So you don't have to go to a holistic practitioner to like help you be holistic. If you use video games to help you relax after work, that's holistic. You know, that's like if it helps you, if it's an escape, then that's that's not it's not holistic health. It's it's uh, you know, that's it's a, it's not health. That's, you know, the opposite of health. It's a detriment. Yeah. So it, it really like holism and holistic healing really is unique to each individual because it really depends on what tools you want to use and what tools you're ready to use. Because not everybody's willing to change their diet. Not everyone's willing to exercise. Not everyone's willing to, um, you know, learn a new musical instrument if they don't know one. But like you have to find the tools that resonate with you and you have to find the tools that like, work with you and the ones you're willing to work on you know sometimes we have to learn to work on the things that we don't aren't ready to work on or we don't want to work on in order to heal and if we don't then we don't heal and that's that's a journey in itself you know that's something that I still am working on because I have neck issues um, and I know if I just did my exercises every day my neck pain would go away but I'm not disciplined enough to do them so I just deal with neck pain so that's and I, I'm at peace with that because I know that's where I'm at. And I know that that's something that I'm working on. Um, so you have to decide what you're comfortable living with at the end of the day, because only you are going to make changes in your life. So if you're okay with, with living in a world where, you know, maybe you're a little bit overweight or maybe you're not where you want to be um, with your... Um, your mental health goals or whatever like that um but you're okay with that then that's fine you know but if if it's becoming an issue if you're like if you're if you're not the weight you want to be or if you're not your mental health goals and you're not okay with that and it's becoming an issue and it's causing you pain in your life you have to find the tools to be able to deal with that and to work towards that and that's where the holistic health comes in and that's where you have to find the tools many different tools and shamanism is all about tools. It's about finding ways to connect, finding ways to heal yourself using many different, uh, you know, meditations, many different um, practical tools, herbs, supplements, whatever, any kind of tool. Uh, this, this battery could be a tool. If I set the intention that every time I pick up this battery, I'm going to feel relaxed and peaceful. And I set that intention and I truly believe it every time I pick up this battery, I'm going to feel relaxed and peaceful. Maybe not fully, but it'll, it'll dampen it. So this can be a tool. You can, you can make it a tool. You know, you can make anything a tool, but yeah, it's like mindful movement. What's that? It's like mindful, mindfully picking up the battery. So it becomes part of your practice. Well, yeah. you, you make this a power object. So you say you infuse it. You're like, every time I pick this up, I'm going to feel peaceful and relax so you really put that energy of peacefulness and relaxed feeling into this and then when you come home and you're like i'm stressed i don't know what to do you come and pick this up and you feel and then you're like you say to yourself i'm peaceful and relaxed and then this is a symbol for a state of consciousness and it, you infuse it with the energy so there is an energetic component because you're putting that energy into it but it's also a symbol for you so it's, it becomes a symbol a reflection a tool that you can use and people do this with substances, you know, like when they, when, just when they have the substance in their hand, like someone who's addicted to cannabis, for example, like when they come home and just when they have the cannabis in their hand, they start to feel relaxed already just by packing the bowl and stuff like that. They start yeah. to feel the relaxation already. They could probably feel the relaxation without hitting the bowl just by doing the preparation because that's a pattern they've associated feeling relaxed with that behavior. So if you can if you can infuse something with that power, you can have the relaxation without it. You know that's the rest is just ceremony, and obviously there's the chemical release when you actually take the substance. Yeah. But there's there's other ways to create um, tools and power things and stuff like that, and you can do the same with nature. You can it's it's all 
shamanism and, and stuff like that's all about understanding how we wire our brains and how like we program ourselves to to operate in certain, certain ways and to to can we condition ourselves to feel certain things and when you realize that you can change that story you can recondition that pattern you can kind of have tools and know how to navigate and create a new state for yourself you know you're not always going to feel happy. You're not always going to feel great. You're going to get stuck. You're going to get lost still because you're human. But you'll have tools to navigate those. And you'll obviously have people and resources you can connect with to learn more and to like understand what's going on. You know, it's not shamanism isn't this like I'm cured of everything. A shaman is someone who is constantly healing themselves, constantly working on themselves and is doing it till the day they die um but they they have certain tools and and ways and rituals and ceremonies that help with that and they share that with other people because they've done the work on themselves so they know how to help someone else who might be in a similar situation yeah i get you and those tools so the healing so yeah. what you say sorry those tools are so important like you say they are the structure of your recovery and they help you get through it um and it is all holistic health like you said yeah yeah um so on the topic of cannabis it's a sister plant or is it his brother plant hemp um, or, yeah hemp, yeah hemp, yeah yeah uh you smoke cbd don't you mm-hmm. yeah i use it occasion yeah yeah oh, um how is that going for you I kind of have mixed feelings about it. Um, I think I'm moving more away from it now because it's something, it still is a relative to cannabis. So it kind of has similar effects in some ways. Um, It makes me think more um, and it kind of makes me feel disconnected from, I start to kind of isolate myself. It kind of like puts pillows around you. It like insulates you in some ways from, from, um, emotional ties from people around you that's the way I feel um so I'll use it sometimes for like just for fun I used I was using it a while like pretty consistently um just because it helped me like to deal with stress and stuff but I've recently been feeling a lot better with stress so I've been kind of like decreasing my use um and so I'm I have like a I have a relationship with it, but I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like. I'm still kind of navigating that one. Um, It's been a helpful tool and it's a plant teacher for sure. Um, But I I don't know if I want to continue to use that, um, that kind of medicine in my, in my toolkit as much anymore. I think I might want to move towards something else. Um, And that's how it goes. You know, you find a, a tool that works for you for a little bit and then the tool no longer serves you. All right, well, Hayden, thank you so much for jumping on this call. And thank you so much for your understanding and patience with the switcheroo from Zoom to Instagram. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today, mate, as always. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm so grateful for you. In order to finish up, I've got a final three questions for you. Just going to be like, short rapid fire questions so just whatever comes to the top of your mind so starting off number one can you tell us three things that you are grateful for today so three things that i'm grateful for today would be one i'm grateful for the experiences and opportunities that i've had thus far in my life um, that has like brought me to this point to where i am in my life Um, Number two is I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to help other people on their journey, um, both like through my YouTube channel, but then also through just daily life and also in the job that I currently am working at. And number three, I'm grateful for the relationships that I have and the relationships that I will have in the future moving forward um, I think that 
connection with one another and sharing is uh is a really important part of of being here and um supporting one another through our journeys and just sharing love and sharing each other with one another i think that's really a cool thing to be able to experience beautiful man i love it question number two then hayden can you tell us two goals that you would like to achieve either by the end of the week or by the end of the year you can do either two for one or one for each as far as short-term and long-term goals go um i feel like a lot of my short-term goals kind of feed into my long-term goals one of my biggest goals right now is to work on connecting with others and sharing with others um so I think long term, I want to focus on developing friendships and connections and um, allowing those to unfold and not retreat within myself. And I guess my short term goal right now is to explore openness with others and openness within myself to allow myself to be me and to share myself in a way that I like is non-judgmental and doesn't um, allows me to be with other people in a way that's genuine to me um, and not trying to filter or make myself bend or shaped in a way that like I think that people would prefer if that makes sense so just allowing myself to be me and um, and sharing that with others so that's like my short-term goal and my long-term is um, long-term friendships and um, working on connections and stuff. Beautiful. And uh, one final question for you, Hidden. Who is one person you'd like to let them know that you love them today? The person that I would like to let know that I love today um, would be my mom. Um, I think we're kind of going through a hard time right now. And I think there's kind of a misunderstanding miscommunication um, there's definitely some like past trauma involved that's causing some barriers between us and so I just want her to know that I do love her and I'm not um, upset with her um, I am kind of triggered by some of the by the way she treats me sometimes and the way that like she articulates things to me sometimes but that doesn't mean that I don't love her it's just that um, some things can be hurtful. Um, and that's, uh, that's just part of learning and growing and um, developing connections. And um, that's just relationships and figuring out how to navigate that. So I just want her to know that I, I love her. Beautiful. Well, shout out to Hayden's mom. All right, Hayden, thank you so much, brother. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you very much for listening, Leprechauns. I'll make sure to tune in next week.